All right, we're about to go live on Facebook. I'm here with John Felito, author of The 90 Day Game. And he's brave and courageous. First time I'm connecting Zoom with Facebook Live. Full disclosure. So I'm going to hit the button and do that. And there might be a slight time lag. Please excuse us for that. It's not instantaneous. And I'm so glad you're here. And share a page I manage, correct? Okay. Getting all such systems in place. Yeah, now, folks, and I hear, you, I hear you in the background, John. It's now connecting Zoom to Facebook Live. Like I said, it's not instantaneous, but mm -hmm. let's... um. I think we're there, and I think we're live. Very nice. So let me come back to my Zoom screen so I can see my good friend. And and when you know it, it's not showing up on my... Folks, just excuse me. I want to make sure. I have my phone on here, too, so that there are comments. We can hmm, see them. Oh, okay. All right. Well, if you're on Facebook Live with us and I don't respond to you, please forgive me. Oh, that's why I have to put a title. Jeez. <laughs> The technology gods are amused. Yeah, but you know it's interesting because it's not a, um, it's not instantaneous, and to my knowledge, we're not able to set this up ahead of time. So we're considering we're. Um, let me just do this here for a second. And I think we're good. Let's hope. Yes. Looks like we're there. <laughs> mm -hmm. And looking to see us here, my boy. All right, I'm coming back to Zoom for that. All right, folks, please excuse that. We're just a couple of minutes past. And um, appreciate you being here if you're here and are watching the replay. Nowadays, most people seem to watch the replay. And as you can see, sitting there so patiently and quietly is uh, John Felito. I have to say, John, I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled you could make the time also to be here with me. I just want to say a couple of things about you. I don't want to, uh, well, no, it's okay. You just, I was going to say I didn't want to embarrass you, but it won't be an embarrassment. Mm -hmm. I say this, John and I met I don't recall exactly, because I've been doing this work for 50 years, but it's at least 20, it might even be 30 years ago. In uh, We did a, a couple of programs together. Uh, we've met, and it's interesting how sometimes, you know, you meet people for the first time and you, rec and you feel like you know them forever. Although we're both from Brooklyn. We're both Brooklyn natives. Uh, and two guys from Bay Ridge. From Bay Ridge, no less, but we didn't know each other there then. And uh, John I had the pleasure of working with him when he was teaching Silva. He's been a friend. He's been a coach for me. He's been a coach to the Silva instructors. And as I mentioned, I, I just want to plug, if you don't mind, it's a shameless plug. Uh, mm -hmm. John's the author of this book, The 90 Day Game, which you can also find it online. He's you know, innovated. And what I really appreciate about this is Regardless of the work we do, regardless of the modality we use, without support, it's all in vain. And too often people invest a lot of time, a lot of money, and they get great content, and they're inspired and motivated, and then they leave the, the, the program, go back to their lives, and nothing happens because of what? Lack of support or getting sucked back into the cultural hypnosis. Uh, we have all hear so often people tell us we seem to become just like those we spend most of the time with. 
And that's so true. It's so important. I think what's more important than the actual training, whether it be the silver method or whatever the training is, is the support that follows, the opportunity to build on it and to establish new neural patterns and behaviors. So anyway. Um, yeah, and Jose Silva knew that early on, right? Uh, with the cottage groups and the silver mm -hmm. graduate meetings, uh, he knew that in order to really, uh, for people to really grasp what he was offering, they had to have some ongoing connection with it. Exactly. And, uh, and you know, that early on. And you're, excuse me, I was looking at the phone again because I believe we're live on Facebook. I set it all up, but it's not showing, it's not registering here. Looking for that. So uh, let's just see. Anyway, I think what might be best, John, is there'll be a recording. If you're watching this and you're on live and we're not acknowledging you, please excuse us. Uh, I have no idea. So to go back to what John was saying about Jose, uh, it's kind of interesting, John, because when I first started in 71, I went back and forth between Brooklyn, Bay Ridge, and Boston, where I went to school at Boston University. And it's kind of interesting how life works because I worked in both areas and I got to know the people in New England who really, in my opinion, put the silver method on the map, at least certainly for the US. Because hmm. many of them were more um, business oriented, organizationally oriented, and that was their prime motivation. So they didn't really last long, but they made a lot of significant contributions to hmm. structure. And that's, I was the director of the graduate organization and Chris Jensen, who might be watching now, still lives here in Connecticut, was our director. He created the term cottage groups. It really wasn't actually Jose, but as one of his original directors, there were 12 directors in the United States. And um, he appointed me the director of that. And we had 33 graduate groups meeting in people's homes weekly. We had a monthly meeting of 300 people. But the lesson I learned was it kept people engaged. And it kept people. So one of the things John and I wanted to explore and have a bit of a conversation about and hopefully give some good takeaways from either Silva techniques or the 90 day game is how to continue to have a warm heart and, and to navigate some of what seems like craziness in the world today with a bit more grace and ease. So, um, let me pass the baton to you, John. <laughs> okay, happy to do well, that. Well, let me ask you a question, make it easier. Sure. I mean, I know this is dear to your heart, and, and, uh, and, and I know John well, and we've worked together. I think it might be helpful is, what are some of the observations you've made that contributed to you, this work of art that you put together, the, you know, the 90 day game? It's, it's actually, by the way, it's, it's a book, he's got a playbook, he's got this, he's got CDs. I mean, if you're serious about supporting yourself and, and, and following through on your goals and aspirations, this is a no-nonsense book. This isn't just about inspiring you. This is about doing the work. So I think people might be curious as to what were some of your motivations, observations that led you to develop this? Well, sure. Uh, I think the thing for me was, and, and now I go back uh, with the Silver Method, when I was 18 years old, I took the course. And so that just com completely changed my worldview. And it validated some hunches I had, but I was a young kid, you know? And uh, that curiosity with consciousness really grabbed me. So I became someone who hardly ever read anything I almost prided myself at getting through school without reading much. <laughs> I became a really average uh, reader because I just got so fascinated at the uh, consciousness. And, uh, and so this, the Silva method was just something that became part of my life. And, I, and when I got involved with coaching people, which is really before my coaching practice, coaching practice started uh, somewhere in the late 90s. But even when I was in my previous incarnation in the financial field, I found myself coaching people because I saw unnecessary suffering. And um, when I was able to have an influence to relieve that unnecessary suffering, 
uh, it really just, I found it just so satisfying. So um, what I wanted to do was to expand upon certain areas that was still rooted in Silva, I would say. And, uh, you know, I make mention of Silva at least a half a dozen times in the game book. I wanted to emphasize the importance of having a clear intention and the value of that, how it is able to, when you have a clear intention, it's very helpful to bring your attention back to where you want to be rather than being, as you talk about, and I talk about in the book, the social hypnosis, it's kind of like, um, you either are in command of your mind or by default, someone else is. And so the idea of having a, what I call a meaningful intention that's filled with passion, purpose, love, and benefits for all, th that construct, I expanded upon it to help people develop that kind of uh, vision and then offered them techniques, very much uh, dynamic meditations as a good part of it to bring their attention continually back to their intention. So, um, you know, I, I, I care less about talking about uh, my own personal experience, but uh, you, you, you know, that's, that's what I, you know, would say that's at, at the top of mind for me, uh, uh, getting that um, integration of the silver method and expanding upon that. And then, you know, I, I, I follow what the, the, I call a congruency model. And I'd like to think that this will uh, play into the things we'll be talking about today. There's a con basic congruency model is that we, we have four resources. We all do. We have uh, the physical body that helps us navigate in this planet. We have a, the mind, a creative mind, a rational mind. We have the emotional uh, aspect or resource. And then we have the soul aspect, which I say is the deepest mm -hmm. part of us. And when those four are in alignment, manifestation occurs. The true reality of it is, if it's aligned in a way that doesn't serve you, you will manifest what doesn't serve you as well. So it, it's really helpful to recognize that it's important for us to align our intention, which I think is coming from the soul level, that deep desire, with our emotional uh, state, our mental faculties and beliefs, and the practical actions that we take. And so that the game book kind of really like my intention for that is to help get these life skills to the player so they can navigate life as just, as we say here with a cool, uh, cool head and a warm heart. And you know, what, what better thing could you focus on, but creating what you truly want because you needed a focal point for the structure of the learning process. And it seemed pretty clear to me, people are always wanting to create stuff. They'll have a desire once it's satisfied, another desire comes up. So why not develop, de deliver these life skills under the focus of what people are really drawn and desiring and yearning to create in their lives and get past the yearning and move desire into intention, which is desire in action. And that's an important distinction for me because we could always desire and yearn and long for, and that's a very empty place to be. But when you transform your desire into a practical structure, when, you've, when you create intention, now you're in, you have desire and action and you're in that process of creation. Hmm. It's interesting, John. Um, you say it so clearly and anytime you and I are talking, whether it be in a group or individually or reading the book, one of the things that I've always appreciated is the clarity. So listening to you say about the intention, we're hearing more and more, I know in my own work or videos I've done, the importance of being in alignment with your, your values, what's really important to you. Otherwise, we almost work against ourselves. And people sometimes feel this tug of war. It's like I, one part of me feels like, yes, yes. But another part of me seems to be pulling me this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that I found in my experiences that we want to really full disclosure here. It's not easy. And I'm a little bit appalled by some of what's going on in, in our industry now of implying, you know, how easy just do this and, you know, just two steps or three steps. And 
being in alignment with your values requires really knowing yourself, a high degree of self-awareness, soul work, if you will. And that, I don't want to make it sound like, it's not that it's hard, it just takes time, it takes effort, it takes, uh, you know, be clear about your intention in making that. And, and I think that's important for us all to recognize. And John mentioned before meditation and one of the thing, by the way, he took silver when he was 18, I was 19. It's, it's just, it's so interesting to me, John. The, the more we talk or commiserate, the more common denominators. It's just, I don't know, I just, I get amused very easily, I guess, but things like that, <laughs> I, just, I find fascinating um, with that. As he goes, but this is why I think meditation is, those of you, if you're silver graduates or students of silver, you know that it's a meditation-based program. It's not really about meditation. It's about uh, taking command of your life. It's a, and that's really an inside job. So if we're truly going to take command of our lives or let alone navigating with a little more grace and ease, we've got to come out of survival and fear. Otherwise, if we're in survival and fear, we're reactive. And any time in history, let alone now, that's gonna that takes a lot of inner work and that takes staying centered and balanced. And at least for me, I find that any kind of meditation is the difference that will make the difference. And if you want to take it to another level and and uh, shall we say make those changes within that put us on automatic. That requires dynamic meditation, which means we can be passive, enjoy the benefits of the meditation, and then actively think and focus. So when John talks about you know, clarity about your intention and being in alignment, you know, we have that, but then we need to, in a sense, um, move away from the default mode of the old patterns that no longer serve us. And that's where the challenge is, is, is being able to recognize those old patterns and then having the tools and the right training, the skill set, if you will, that enables us to create a new narrative, to create a new script. And I'm thrilled. I wish Jose were alive, by the way, because now I can say this, all the science backs it up. We are literally, when we do dynamic meditation, creating new neural patterns, neuro, creating new pathways. And if they're re reinforced enough and there's enough repetition, and it's interesting, neuroscience says within 30 to 90 days, way before neuroscience came up with the research telling us that, by the way, I know that John, for one, was talking about that. It's kind of interesting, things that we know intuitively and in our heart that now science catches up with. So many things you've already triggered here. Uh, I'll kind of work backwards. We can have an insight sometimes that we think is a game changer for us. And a couple of days can go by and we can forget what that powerful insight that we thought was going to change. <laughs> so, uh, it, things are fleeting that way. Uh, we need to be able to redirect our attention back uh, and repetition is what changes those neural pathways. Yep. And it's a 90 day game. If it could be done in a weekend, I would do it in a weekend, but it's a 90 day game for that very reason that it takes time to keep pulling back your attention on your intention. There's a section in the game book I call the power of directed attention. And I'm, it's a very challenging thing to get across to people because everyone has attention, right? You know, if your attention's on something, but the power to direct it is another matter altogether. And that requires that repetition to be able to direct your attention. And Silva helps us learn how to do that. The 90 day game, also supports us in learning how to do that. But it, it comes from this ability to, to uh, continually redirect our attention. But we need to make that choice, personally make that choice. It's interesting, I always look at words and repetition is constructed of petition, which is to ask for. Huh. And repetition is the way I see repetition, to ask for it again and again. And, and when you ask enough, you actually get what you're asking for. So it's repetition is really so much a part of, of what uh, makes things possible for us. 
The other thing you said early on is it isn't easy. And I agree, it is not easy, but it doesn't have to be struggle. So mm -hmm. there's a distinction in the game book, and I've got to have like these dis distinctionary in the back of the book, also provides definitions because language is very important to me. And, and so there's a distinction between effort and struggling. And if we put it in the game context, can you think of a game that's easy, that's really rewarding and satisfying? Or is it the games that have the challenges that keep you engaged and keep some satisfaction and fulfillment going because you accomplished something? And um, I was talking to someone recently at a kind of a different uh, context, but I guess video games are a simple thing to think about because like when you get on a new level in a video game, you keep falling off the, 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 ro the ramp, let's say, and you keep trying and, and you're able to, when you keep, keep at it, you're able to jump to the next level. Oh, I did it, you know, and you get that shot of uh, dopamine, right? And you go to the next level and you go to the next level. So what better game is there than the game of life? And, and what better investment of time and attention can there be but investing in your own life? So, um, it's not easy, but you know that's that's part of the the game that makes it interesting. Because as long as we're in this dimension, there's going to be meaningful contrast, and so we see what we don't want, but it introduces us to what we do want, and this is that contrast that brings us back and forth to saying, you know, this is something important to me, something that aligns with my values. And this is the last thing I'm going to say before I hand it back over to you. You mentioned values. Some people really draw a blank when, they, when I ask them the question, what, do you, what, do you, what are your values? Because part of the, that meaningful intention that's filled with passion, purpose, love, and benefits must incorporate what our values are. It must be aligned with our values. And um, so I suggest to people, if they're a little stumped on what values means, just think about what is valuable to you. Uh, look at it that way. What's valuable in your life? What do you place a value on? And that kind of also aligns with another word, appreciation. Um, a lot of talk about gratitude for good reasons, because gratitude is incredibly powerful. And our ability to direct our attention on the riches already present in our life with rich gratitude is so uh, such, such a consciousness shift from a uh, deficit scarcity thinking to abundant mindset. So uh, we hear the word gratitude so much that it be starts sounding trite. Okay, here we are in this other new age kind of uh, program I'm listening to and they're talking about gratitude and it almost becomes like, oh, that again. But we, we, if, I like using the word appreciation because if you think of a, a fine wine or a fine art or things that you appreciate, they grow in value. So when you're appreciating the things that are in your life, they too will grow in, in value and they'll bring other insights to you to appreciate and to be grateful for. So values are a key piece of it. And you write, it has a lot to do with self awareness. And it's something that if we continue to play with basic principles, basic ideas, structure that's offered through the silver method. And that's the other thing that I guess I was attracted to uh, with the silver method because it was so practical because it was, uh, it, it had, uh, you know, techniques that you can use. And so you'll see a lot of order in the game book because it's uh, so much appreciate the importance of having structure, because there's so many things we could talk about that could be so overwhelming. But when we have a structure and we could layer that structure on with the new information, keep bringing that information back through repetition <laughs> and building upon that, repetition. we have a very powerful uh, framework that keeps us on course. So, you know, it could be daunting, but if you have a structure and you're dedicated to taking on uh, what I think is a very rewarding challenge, 
uh, then you're having, uh, you're really accomplishing something in your life. Well, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here smiling away because I'm continually reminded about how much we're on the same page about appreciate. You said a lot there to go back. Let me rewind a little bit. My comment about it's not easy. I say it that way only because when people I find have unreal myself, anybody has an unrealistic expectation. And they're demanding, especially like if we're comparing to other people. We don't know their life circumstance. We don't know, you know, so often we look at them and say, wow, we're in awe. And yet we're not paying attention to, but it took them maybe 20, 30 years to get to that point where we didn't hear anything about. You see this all the time with entertainers and musicians. We just see a more polished, finished product that's the result of decades of work. Absolutely. And that, that's really where I was coming from because, yeah, thank you, because words do make a difference. It's just that people need to be more compassionate of themselves and give themselves permission not to be perfect and recognize that it's a journey and we're all doing the best we know how to do with what we have. And where I was coming from with that is I've come to understand, although I'm not a psychologist, but yet versed and a student of emotional intelligence and psychology, I've come to understand and I, in, in all my work teaching and seminars that if we beat ourselves up, we, we weaken self-esteem. If we're not compassionate and self-forgiving, the fact is that it's important that we feel, I'm enough. I deserve to be happy. I deserve to be successful. I deserve to prosper. Because if we shame ourselves, it weakens self-esteem. And it, it, an easy way to look at that with gratitude, it's, it's funny you said that, John, because all the research now, there's a ton of research. We're talking about with brain scans, fMRIs, and even in terms of biology, that when one is in a state of gratitude, of appreciation, it changes our brain chemistry, and it changes our body chemistry, it reduces cortisol levels, and it puts us into what some of it called a new state of being, where we're more open, we learn faster. You know, we refer to it as that alpha state. If we just think in real world though, when you were saying that, I was thinking, how many times have you, any of you people watching, been with somebody who's a chronic complainer? No matter what you do for them, they want more, more, more. They're never happy or satisfied. If you've ever been in a friendship or a relationship like that, it's horrible. That's all I, I can say. It's horrible because it's like, no matter what you do, it's not enough. And you're always struggling. Unless we can see through that, and be strong enough, it can really get us. But if you think of it in terms of life, and you're at a networking meeting, you're at a party, you're a gathering of friends, you're at a business conference, or a big event, and you're schmoozing around with people. Somebody who's complaining about the room is too cold, he's just trying to sell us something, whatever it is, they come across as being negative, and if you watch, if you just observe, say nothing, just walk around and observe, and I, I do, do, do do this, people will move away from that person. And meanwhile, that person might have something really valuable to offer, might be the best of the best in a certain field or area of expertise. But human nature being what it is, people push away, you know, pull away from that. Whereas somebody who's always got something kind to say, who always finds something positive no matter what's going on, they seem to draw people like a magnet. And I see this in business. And so a takeaway for anyone in business, in sales, is the more you appreciate your customers, the more you appreciate your clients or your students or your patients and express that, the more they want of you. The, and, and you're not doing it to manipulate them. I mean, it, it, when it's genuine and, it, and it's hard. And I guess what we're both saying in so many words is when it comes to creating the life of your design. First, being in that state keeps us open to possibilities and to recognize them. And it makes us more attractive to perhaps attract the people, place, the situation, excuse me, that will help us to fulfill that. And that's really where I was coming from. That's the work, the effort. That's what takes, what, what takes the time. And to have, I know some people don't like the word realistic, you know, goals. 
you know, remember smart goals and the R is, you know, realistic. And I, and I get that. Uh, John Butcher of um, Lifebook fame and having a conversation with him. And I get what he's saying, that we all want to imagine possibilities. So maybe it's not a matter of having realistic goals as much as recognizing here I am now. This is the skill set I have now. This is what I'm able to do now. These are the resources I have in my life now. And it can change if I'm willing to invest in myself with whatever that takes. But right now, this is as far as I can go, you know, if that makes sense, you know, with respect to it. So I like what you're saying about the structure. When you have a structure, it's easy to fall into something and then you're, you're, um, I don't like to be scripted. And I and I, I know you, John, to be the same. By the way, those of you watching, we had no discussion about what we were going to talk about. John wrote me, I'm, I'm taking notes to remind myself, this is the intro, three bullet points of some ideas and I did with him. And our intention was just to kind of build on that and to serve. And, and frankly, I like being that way. Even when I do videos, I have a topic, I know, what I, I know the topic and I just want to run with it. You know, for that. Right, right. Uh, because the over preparing can confines a conversation. I think uh, we enjoy more of a facilitation than uh, than that uh, having that confined, prepared. This is what I have to say. Am I remembering what I have to say? Where you know all that sort of thing. It, it's it's distracting. You're not being present when you're when that happens. Uh, you triggered another one for me. Well. There's actually five or six. Here, but I'm not going to address all of them. But one thing I want another distinction I'd like to make is between uh, an intention and the goal, because uh, we're we're kind of brought up on being goal oriented. You talk about these smart goals or realistic goals or whatever, and um, there's some like really big distinctions because uh, when you set a goal you're kind of conditioned to setting the goal and then doing whatever you have to do to get to that goal. And it's like uh, having blinders on. I use the example of a, uh, I don't know where the image came to me when I was putting the book together, <clears throat> but there was a guy swinging a machete trying to get his, whacking his way through the, these tall weeds to find a clearing. And so he was determined and just kept whacking away going sh straight ahead. Um, so determined, but he never looked left or right. And if he just looked left, even through the, the high weeds, he would have saw a big clearing there. But the focus of mm -hmm. gotta achieve this goal restricts us from possible greater opportunities. Hmm. So understanding what's underneath the goal, understanding what's the driving urge. My soul is talking to me. Uh, there's something I desire here. There's an urge that's coming up. And if I can allow myself to be with un getting greater context, context of what that urge is, it may be practical in the moment to have that particular goal in mind, but it may be, if it's restrictive if you stay stuck with that, because this, if you stay to the heart and the spirit of what I truly want, things open up in different ways. I did really truly want one. I finally went ahead and um, got certified as a Silva instructor. At that time, I really, really wanted to have a big impact with it, reach a lot of people. And I wasn't gaining a certain level of traction. And so I said, it's interesting because I have this desire to have impact like this and have a meaningful, play a meaningful part in people's lives. But uh, I'm trying this and I'm trying that and I'm, I'm bordering on struggle rather than effort. And I just opened up and sat with the urge and uh, Joan and I, we were reading in bed and, and she was reading um, a publication that had, uh, um, uh, it had an ad of, uh, how to become a six-figure consultant, <laughs> right? And she said, maybe this is what you want. She liked the six-figure piece at that time, because six <laughs> figures back in the, you know, now, you know, six figures is not the number they use right now. They go with the seven or more. But that's what, so I, I said, oh, let me take a look at it. And, and next to that ad, 
was um, uh, an ad about coaching. And I said, I'm going to go take that class. I'll take the other one too, but because there's a short little uh, classes. I'm uh, learning addicts, I think it was. And so when I went to that uh, coaching um, class with uh, Coach U, I, I literally was less than three minutes that I was sitting there that I said, this, I'm, this is what I'm going to do. Huh. Because I was, when I was teaching Silva, I'd always uh, offer and invite uh, graduates to have a coaching session one-to-one -one with me. So like you say, they could connect the dots between what they want and take some practical action to get it. So I was already doing this coaching thing. And I, when I turned to the coaching thing, I, I, the impact of that one-to-one -one relationship in coaching really just, you know, I was home with it. And so I, I started a coaching practice that grew ridiculously full in a, such a short period of time. Within six months, I had a, a very full practice. And the interesting thing was I had larger silver classes <laughs> because people got to know me and, and, and came to the classes, brought their friends. So uh, I ultimately got the desi desire to get more people in the class, but I also got a, a really a career that I would not have uh, recognized had I just stayed nose to the grindstone with the blinders on and forced the goal. So I think it's important for people to have, um, you know, goals within an intention, but understand that the intention is uh, it's wider, it's it's bigger, it's got more context. And, um, and, and when you stay in touch with that urge and perhaps uh, bring it into meditation, um, connect with the source of all there is, um, and whether you call it intuition or what you will, uh, you'll get insights. And that's really one of the things uh, you know, you talk about compassion, and so we get to talk about that alone. Um, I mean, when I reached the point of uh, recognizing that I was perfectly imperfect and that everybody <laughs> is perfectly imperfect, uh, there's no one that's perfect. And, and when I just dropped away the need to feel like I had to be something that I wasn't, and I reached acceptance with that, that, that was a, another significant uh, life-changing piece for me. But since we talk talking about, um, I think keeping a cool head and a warm heart, I did want to address uh, the cool head piece, because uh, if there's, uh, we're really been, uh, resonating with the social hypnosis of the day, we can be very agitated, and of course, meditation is going to bring, uh, you know, stimulate that uh, parasympathetic nervous system, calm us down, and I, I also feel I'm comfortable talking about. Uh, prayer uh, more recently, because I recognize when I offer the conversation around prayer, people say, gee, I'm glad you gave me the permission to do that, because everybody's <laughs> making fun of me that I'm believing in some sky god. But really, um, I find it difficult to look at how the amazing things a human being can do and not believe that there's some source that brought this forward. And I'm not saying it's a person or an entity. It could be an en energy that goes beyond my physical uh, limitations to understand. So I feel I'm connected with the source when I go into meditation. I have developed a strong belief that goes beyond belief to a knowing that when I have a question, I'm going to receive an answer and get an insight. And I don't think it really matters whether or not you put it in the context of God, uh, universe, mother nature, whatever you want to call it, we have that capacity to draw insights. If we recognize that I don't have to figure it all out by myself. Because we try to figure out things by yourself, you contract your energy, you're back in your rational mind. But when you open up to receiving insights, when you open up to being receptive, those insights will come to you. And uh, so I, that was one uh, piece I wanted to uh, talk about as I talk about meditation and to connect with the source uh, of however you view that to be. Uh, it, it, that, in, that intuitive ability, and I know that's, this is your uh, favorite area at intuition. And uh, I'll, uh, you know, 
wrap up this my end of this in the moment. But I feel that the, this is kind of, uh, there's a couple other techniques to cool down, but the meditation, the sense of uh, prayerfulness, appreciation, connecting with the source, being open and receptive. Uh, to me, this is really what uh, allows us to cool things down. And then we could move forward with a warm heart on meaningful intentions, like I say, that are filled with a purpose, a love and benefits for all. So. <laughs> wow. You've triggered a lot of things here too, I'm taking notes. <laughs> to go back to what you are saying before about the goals and, and the vision, it's interesting, I find myself, I think I used to be, when I was much younger, like a dog without, without a bone, you know, chasing it. I still find it very hard to say no and that laser-like focus. And then I found slowly but surely, I'm, it's at least 10 years, maybe more, I stopped setting goals. Like at the end of the year, I mean, I have goals, I have aspirations that I want to accomplish, but I find myself much more reflecting on daily and in general on life vision. Like you said, our values, what I want to be able to do. Like for example, uh, people often remark in the civil organization, I'm 50 years. It's interesting how many people I've seen come and go in the organization and I frankly don't think I'm any smarter or any better. There's a lot of really amazing people that I've learned from. And yet when I reflect, but how is it that I'm able to sustain this as a practice and it's a career and it's, it, it's a, well, it's a career, you know, and, it, and it's a business too. It's because I'm very, the, the life vision, the values of what we're doing to help contribute in a way that might help make the world a little bit better. And I find that with what's going on now during this pandemic era and, you know, people are feeling lonely, isolated, uh, the anxiety of who or what do I believe? Is this okay? Is this safe? I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty. The thing that I find for myself in my life and the lives of others, I'm listening to you, John, same, similarly, is that if you're really clear about your intention, if you're clear about your vision and what you're working toward, it gives us emotional flexibility and it gives us behavioral flexibility to navigate and make those adjustments that, we, that, that, that you need to do. And I, find, I believe I'm far more flexible than I've ever been in my life and moving. And it's not that I take it a day at a time, but I, and yet I do find as my days go that things come up that fit, that are very important, that are very meaningful, and I'm able to flow into it more easily than being stuck in a focused laser-like structure that, in, that inhibits me. And I think today, well, anytime, but let's, since we're talking about today, nowadays, people really need that, that kind of flexibility emotionally, that kind of resilience. People are pivoting redefining their work. Not just the idea of working at home, but many people have had to re restructure how they interact. People in sales, person-to-person -person contact with them, their handshaking is so important, but in this current trend, it's turned to video, you know, Zoom. And I know many of salespeople, one of them is my son, our eldest, and it's not holding him back. He's doing as good as before because he's pivoted and is adapted to using the technology and finding ways to service clients to do the job and to maintain that. And so when we talk about having a, a cool head, a warm heart, when we're attached to our vision, when we're connected to it and our values, it seems to be easier then. We're more secure in what we feel and it almost doesn't matter what the opinions are around us or what the social hypnosis is. We, as you said before, you know what you know. And when you know what you know, you're more easily connected with your heart, your gut, your intuition. And it's interesting you said that, John, is, I, I think you, you were raised Catholic also, like I was. That's right. So for me, it's very easy to, and I went eight years with Dominicans, four years with Severian brothers. You know, in my history, I think you know this, we had a Pope in our family. And my cousin, when I was a kid growing up, I was his altar boy, was a bishop, a missionary, a Franciscan. So for me, my default is very easy to default to God, whatever that means. 
I don't know anybody really understands that. But I do believe, I, I do know, that there is an energy. The universe keeps moving with or without us, source, nature, whatever. There's an evolving. I find myself now, almost daily, if not daily, going to bed. And part of my meditation is, thank you, source, for guiding me to know what are the right moves for me to make. Or if there's an investment to make, or a new strategy, or whatever it might be. Thank you for guiding me to know, is this in alignment with my values? Because I'm feeling a little bit confused. Will this serve my greatest good? And I would say for, for everybody, that's a, whether you're new to meditation or not, an important takeaway for all of us is to just work on just being clear about who's important to you in your life, what's important to you. You know, what, what, when you think of your best self emerging or your best life, how would you know you're living your best life? To actually sit down and reflect on that. What, would, what kind of interactions would you have with your family, with your friends, with the people you interact with in your community? And the clearer we are about that, the easier it is to recognize it in people, in situations that guide us so that we support that. And I would say it again. I, again, it's why I really so appreciate your work with the 90-Day Game, John, is that without support, it's too easy to slip back into old patterns. I confess, I still teach Silva, even though I relate to it differently, because it supports me, <laughs> meaning in terms of emotionally and spiritually. Every time I'm in a class with people facilitating, I find myself saying, oh yeah, I gotta do, oh, I haven't used that technique. Okay. It, keeps, it keeps me in the game. Even my wife, Barbara, yeah. I don't know if Joan talks to you like this, but she'll say, you need to do a class soon. <laughs> before the, the greatest beneficiaries of it right because it keeps <laughs> work keeping this consciousness in mind right exactly, so, uh, exactly. The beneficiaries of it one thing i would want to you know john uh, before you ask me that yeah. can i just um do that i want to also respect your time because i never check with sure. you time wise sure. but I, let me just um check because this is not working on my phone i just want to double check i need to go off the zoom screen to check to see if there are people there looking for us to just acknowledge them and say hello if there are any questions. And if you're watching this and I didn't do that, please forgive us because it was working perfect on my phone the other day when I tested it. I always test and test. And for some reason, it's not showing up. So let me just, get me one second. I just need to put this back here. Nope. Oh, go here. All right, that explains a lot. Waiting. Yeah, I had a couple of emails, Ken, that said uh, that people have tried to get in and uh, were not able to. Yeah, so, the um, it says here waiting for live video. That's what I'm seeing there. So. Yeah, and it and I'm looking here, and there's nothing here to to um engage it, if you know what I mean. So apologies here. I'll own it. It's me. Lately, I can, I, I'd make a little time for us to do a little troubleshooting together because maybe it's, it's more it's helpful to do that if you want to try a platform while I'm on another one kind of thing, you know? Um, it says, wait, hmm. it might even be the connection. I cannot see. I use the camera. Use the stream. I'm not using a stream key. And now I'm not able to access something that's here on the screen. You copy, hmm. show live tab, reset. Well, gratefully you're recording it on Zoom and you can then upload it to YouTube. And Yeah, because everything is the same as it was before. Mm -hmm. Well, again, um, it's on me, not on John, although I know that we're not trying to blame anything. Uh, <laughs> I had made announcements all week, <laughs> so yeah. we'll put the recording. If you'll work, if you'll work through it. Yeah, it, it's it's um, on there. For some reason, it's not going live on Facebook. And there's nothing, usually there's a button, you, you know, you're now live or hit this, and all those were taken, and it says it's looking for it. So something may have happened with the connection. Anyway, okay, so you were about to say before, do you remember what you were going to say? Yeah, there's a, and kind of an important message I would want to mm. share. You know, you and I uh, have our own commonalities and urges to have impact and 
support people. And, and I, I, it's important for people listening to recognize that that's our thing. Doesn't have to be your thing. Um, but focus on what brings you joy because uh, the, I think that's a way of opening up the door. You know, so I hear, you know, people will say, I don't have any passions. Uh, I don't have any sense of purpose or whatever. Uh, focus on what brings you joy. I think that's kind of key to the thing. After all, uh, we talk about, you know, uh, the conditions we're under now and some of us are a little bit more uh, caught up in the social hypnosis. Those that are like putting attention to the joy of life, the, the gift that life truly is, and engaged in life, have more attention on the joy of life than on the this conditions that are, are truly temporary, and all of it's temporary, including our own lives. I would, I just would never want to squander a day of my life. Maybe it was in a past life I was confined or something, but every day I wake up, I have this feeling like of incredible release that, you know, look at the dynamic world uh, I'm living in and all of its movement and changing and, and some things seem stable and other things seem, you know, I look out at my brook, I see big, tall, strong trees, but I see water flowing, you know, there's these, uh, this whole dynamic thing we're living in. And even those trees that look so, so st st uh, static are alive too. It's just the, the whole thing about just appreciating life and the joy of life, I think it's so important. Uh, as an example, uh, and I think you know, Ken, that I like to fly airplanes. And as life uh, had it, um, I deferred flying for the, uh, the last 10 years, actually. And it was just, uh, just a couple of months ago, I got back into it. And I got so much joy from it huh. and my attention on it and studying and all, I mean, the, the sky could fall and I wouldn't know, you know, I mean, like, I'm just really en enjoying this part of my life. And so I, I, I think it's important for people to recognize that you can have, a, a, you can find meaning in life in your own way. A lot of times people think I should be more like you or I should be more like this other person. Just be more of you and allow yourself to connect with what's valuable to you, what brings you joy. We're not here forever. So let's enjoy the moment while we're here. It's a short blip on a radar screen. And if we spend our days worrying about what tomorrow's going to be, we're losing out on the opportunity of what we can enjoy today. So I think it's very important for people to recognize there's a wide range of interests. There's a, a wide range of ways of being. Uh, don't try to be hmm. someone else. Just try to be yourself in your perfect imperfection. Seek joy because you know when it's a real contribution when you're in a joyous state, you're really a you know, wonderful person to be around. And it doesn't really matter how you're getting your joy as long as you're not you know, harming people in the process. And so uh, uh, even within the game, it's always recommended that we step away and take some lightness and energy breaks, things that bring us emotional lightness and things that bring us uh, energy because we need that fuel to enjoy a fabulous life and, uh, and take on the challenges that life offers. So I just wanted to, and I don't know how effective I am at getting the point across, allow yourself to be your authentic, your authentic self and gravitate to the things that bring you joy and other things will just open up and follow from there rather than shutting yourself on what you should do or what you can't do or who you're not. I'd love for you to embrace who you are and hmm. allow yourself to enjoy your life. It's, a, it's really a unique gift and something that should never be squandered. That's really, and maybe that's a should. <laughs> well, a, I think it's wonderful advice. It makes perfect sense. I mean, exactly when we're, when it's in our heart and we're following joy, one of the big obstacles to any kind of performance, be it peak performance or high performance or whatever people call it, is yeah. dread. You know, dreading the activities, dreading the day. So if you are following your bliss and the joy, and you and and if you can monetize it, even better. 
you know, with respect. I would like to add um, something to that. Uh, I don't know time was, but just a simple tip uh, to people watching. If you're a silver method practitioner, you have the tool, the three to one method, powerful way to move your state of awareness, your consciousness from what we call a waking state beta into alpha and or theta. John's talking about taking these lively, you know, the energizing breaks. Many ways to do that, whether it be going for a walk, drinking, some stretching. But one of the takers I like to recommend if you're not doing this is throughout the day is to just simply take a short pause, close your eyes, three slow, deep belly breaths. Again, if you know the technique, the three to one, use that because you've developed it and it works so effectively. It's very powerful. Those who haven't done silver, we spend four days in silver life and intuition system practicing this and developing it. So simple way is the three slow deep breaths, and they just feel some genuine appreciation, something that brings you joy, someone in your life, that, a smile on your face. And I always make a joke, and if you follow my work, I often, this is one of my tools that I use, one of my um, triggers. It was given to me by my children with the grandkids, and I look at this, and it puts a smile on my face. You know, and it gives me nice. <laughs> I feel good. You know, and I know I sound like a silly grandfather, and I am, I own it, but before I give a presentation, do a class, or, or tomorrow I'm being interviewed, for example, I do this. I look at some of the videos, and I just, no matter what, how serious I'm feeling, what's going on, I know it works every time. So we all need to find things like that. It may be your cat, it may be your dog. But in that eyes closed state, just feel some appreciation for 30 seconds or so. And then maybe imagine some of your values or your best self emerging or your best life, or maybe it doesn't have to be your best life, but an improvement of movement, making progress as if it's happened already. That's what dynamic meditation is, is that you're not just sitting passively and soaking up the good vibes, which is fantastic, and just feeling a good emotion. You're also directing some thoughts. And that opens you up to your, your intuition. That will put you into a state where you'd be more likely to recognize opportunities that are out there, and it will give you that resilience, that ability to bounce back and to sustain your energy during the day. If you just do that throughout the day, not just once, for just two, three, maybe five minutes, you'll find you'll sleep better at night, you'll have more. Just that simple little practice in between studying. So um, I, I think I'm... Um, I guess I'd say uh, it's important what you're saying because uh, are you using words throughout here about flexibility and resilience? And uh, if we're not flexible, we could break, you know? Uh, a reed bends with the wind. And a lot of what we're uh, talking about and the practices of the, of the Silver Method and the 90 Day Game are really of resilient building tools so that we can navigate this life with a cool head and a warm heart. And there's no magic pill that's going to eliminate any of the challenges that we have because they, you're, we're better off to recognize the challenges are going to happen. And that's what we do with them that leads us to other opportunities. And how many challenges, when we reflect in our own lives, if those challenges didn't present themselves, how we wouldn't have grown to take another step to create something else in our lives. So that um, really, really important point to uh, recognize that we have that capacity to be flexible and allow ourselves, you know, that uh, give ourselves that gift and to be, be happy to be imperfectly Perfect, because you're perfect in your own imperfection. And uh, that, I think, is a, a, in and of itself a, a good release. Just to reemphasize that, is the difference that makes the difference is taking those little, we call them alpha breaks, because you're, what you're doing is you're managing your energy. Because if, you have, if your stress hormones are raging in your body, you're not going to have a warm heart. It's hard to have a warm heart and to be flexible like that because you're going to go into stress mode or survival mode, which is reactive. So, especially if you're watching the news or you're getting news about things going on, it's, it's, it's a sure shot way. So we're, we've, we've been going for about a little over an hour. I'm going to 
say probably a good time to start wrapping up and and saying oh, I just got to notice my internet connection's unstable. Funny, good timing. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but but John, if you don't mind, I just wanted to uh, just some parting thoughts. I mean, there's a lot here. We could probably go forever, which is not really appropriate at this point. But I just want to say again, it's the 90daygame.com. If you want to contact John or or, or the book. I couldn't say enough about it. And there's a lot more to it that this also available now online. John really invested quite heavily in working on creating some videos and ways to make it more accessible to people, depending what your style of learning might be. If you're new to the silver method, or even if you know it, if you haven't read this little blue book it was written in the early 70s, there are lots of books, hundreds written about there are several written by the founder, but this particular one is one of my, if not favorite, only because it's structured, it gives exercises, it's from Jose himself, Jose Silva, and there's a lot of research in the back, documentation. Just be aware, it uses the older language of basic lecture series. In 2007, we had a renaissance, John remembers. He was a big part of the renaissance, and it was just more rebranding, working on modernizing, so it's civil life and intuition system for that. Funny, it was the first, but still the best, that book. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, I guess I agree, too. As graduates, there are other books, but this one is just very complete. And I find if you'll find if you read one of these books, you'll know whether you want to go farther or not. It's that simple. You know, you're, and even if you don't go further with it, you'll get value. I hear this all the time from people writing. So, um, John, I really appreciate you making the time from your coaching schedule. It's fun to be with you, Ken. And for that, and I'm going to stop the recording and say, everybody, keep shining. What John was saying, keep following your joy. I, I you know, just want to repeat what John was saying. I think that's so important, and and also love yourself enough to invest in yourself, to take time to do whatever it takes to keep yourself up and supported and healthy. Uh, some people say that some people take better care of their pets than they do themselves. <laughs> I think it's time that we take as good a care of ourselves as we do our pets so that we can be there for our pets. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> our, our children. So um, I'm going to, John, do you have any parting thoughts, something that you wanted to, was there something that maybe I missed this, how, how people can contact you? Well, I, 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 one thing I might say in terms of, you know, it's 90daygame.com if they want to go to the website. Uh, my name, John, and uh, Ford, if you want to write me, uh, john at 90daygame.com. Uh, if you're interested in looking at the intention thing, there's a, I have five jumpstart questions in the game book. And you can, uh, if you go to Amazon and you look inside the book and you go to game day one, you'll see those five jumpstart questions. So that's uh, one way of quickly getting your uh, hands on that. And I guess there's an excerpt of the, of the game book on, law, on the website too. But however you want to do it, if you're attracted to the idea of building a, an attention, so your attention can be on what you want to create rather than the environment causing you to uh, direct your attention. Uh, it's a really great idea to develop something that you can anchor to to direct your attention. Like I say, if you're not controlling uh, or in command of your own mind, there'll be plenty of people <laughs> and, and circumstances available to control it and come take command of your mind for you. And I don't think we want to do that. So that's about I, it, Ken. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you. Pleasure. And those jumpstart questions, I'm smiling again. They're very powerful. And when you do them with pen, paper, then do also the right your eyes and integrate them. Say that again. Do the right thing, we say. The, and the right thing is with a W. <laughs> W-R-I-T-E. Do the right thing. It's also very good for emotional expression. Get it out of your head and on the paper where you, you can see it. And it's just another way of cooling down the system. All Super. right. All right. So let me just stop this. And then John and I would just talk for a moment.